Good morning all and hi again from Gothenburg and Lindholm Science Park. Today uh, is the second day of uh, AI Sweden Partner Week, uh, the second edition. So it's a lot of twos today. And today we're going to talk about tech. So yesterday I had Eva Josefsson with me uh, talking about the data and the data day. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peter Kurzweli. I'm uh, head of the, uh, the startups at AI Sweden and also a program developer. Uh, so really developing programs to try to create value for you partners. And today with me, instead of Ebba, uh, I have real experts guiding me uh, through this the tech day. So Chital ready? I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, you are our computer scientist or data scientist. And today we're really going to dive into the tech. So what are we going to do today? Yes. Uh, yeah, my name is Shital Reddy and I work as a data scientist at AI Sweden. Today I have the honor of guiding you all through the agenda. The theme for today is Edge AI and Federated Learning. So we have seen that the world is slowly moving from cloud computing to edge computing. It's not surprising uh, because of the benefits edge computing provides, low latency, bandwidth, and also uh, security and privacy is solved. But solving, uh, but working with edge computing poses some significant challenges. It's quite frustrating to work with these resource constrained devices. But nevertheless, few of our partners have already tackled these challenges. So let's hear from our speakers, uh, from these partner companies who are going to uh, show us how they tackle these challenges. Great. Right. Uh, so I, I will now introduce my co-moderator and an amazing colleague, Eric Wilson. Thanks, Ital. So I will be trying to co-moderate from a distance instead of being part of you guys in Gothenburg. And I'm currently sitting here in, in Skåne. It's so great to be with you. Right. So Eric is going to tell us uh, more about the projects that we are currently running at AI Sweden. Right. So Thank you. Eric, go on. Thanks. So I'm at AI Sweden, my, my title is a project manager. So I thought we should just give a glimpse of what we're doing, what type of projects we're running, and what has happened since last time we had our partner week, which was in May, I guess. So let's see. So the projects we are running can be cat categorized in this way. It's uh, usually the big four, you can say, the healthcare, the mobility, uh, democracy, and climate change. And the least common denominator for this project is that we're trying to engage in sort of the, the biggest challenges or the challenges that uh, can be solved for the, for the most partners. So for instance, we engage in running a project with NLP trying to unite Sweden and creating NLP models in uh, Swedish language. And also unify the, uh, the healthcare system, you can say, that's locked into almost 20 data silos at, and they don't share data. So that's part of the projects we are trying to, uh, to work with. And personally, I'm working with uh, a project you can say called decentralized learning or a new type of file sharing or data sharing technology called federated learning. And I thought I should just give you a bit of a glimpse into what we're trying to do there. So why federated learning and decentralized learning is so interesting is because you as a, perhaps as a data scientist or engineer has found yourself in this position that you wanna do models, but your managers prohibit you or the, the legal group in, at your company are saying like, we have something called GDPR. We cannot actually do what we want with this data. And this usually comes from how you do machine learning today is that you centralize all the data into one place. Either you need to give away your data or you need to ask someone to give the data to you. And that's a use constraints uh, that we have noticed that are Sweden who's operate in various fields and agencies and, and municipalities. So instead of giving away your, your data, you could just start sharing models. And this is what this new type of file sharing technology called federated learning has the, the promise to do. So instead of sharing the data, you actually send the model to your node or client, and then you train locally 
on that node. And the nodes can either be an edge device like a phone or car or like uh, a server. And then you aggregate the weights of the models to one main model. So we hope that this will be a workaround of the sort of ghost called GDPR. So the take, take home message here is that there's two main categories of technologies called cross device and cross silo. And why I mentioned the cross device is because we speak about edge today. So that's why it's so relevant. So they are Sweden, we're trying to do what's called a virtual test bed. And it has been a project running from August this year till end of March. And we're doing this together with you as partners here listed to your right. So here focusing on tech, uh, we're looking into four different POCs with various frameworks that we're testing on different type of data sets and different type of models. And our deal is that the outcome of this for you guys will be a couple of documented demos where you can try these and also a legal document like a, a know-how or how-to document because we meant, we, we, we're noticing that the bottleneck in all organization is the legal constraint. So we hope that when you come back to us in, in March, we can give you the, these, uh, these files and say, here, start, start working with federated learning. <clears throat> and how all this connects to today's session is that I'm sort of secretly announcing an announcement uh, that we're currently building up something that we call an edge lab. And this is how, for instance, the learnings we're doing with Federated will, will be packaged, but also uh, creating a actually a world unique playground for decentralized learning. So consisting of, uh, of both industrial grade hardware with huge contributions from our partners, HPE and, and Sensact. And this sort of playground will be available for you as partners uh, and we're opening up with a workshop on the 27th of January, but note that the, the official press release is the 11th of December. So this is sort of just an announcement about an announcement trying to create a bit of a hype. So here you see the contact details if you are want to be on a short list for this or have any, any questions of, of what I just mentioned. So with that, I, I give it to you, Chitan. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for running us through the projects that we're currently working uh, at AI Sweden. Uh, yeah, now it's time to uh, introduce our first speaker. Uh, so our first speaker is the CEO and co-founder of Embedded, Hans Solomonson, and he's going to talk about the efficient deep learning in embedded systems. Good morning, Hans. Good morning, Shatal. Good morning, Peter. Thanks Good for having morning. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, uh, joining uh, us today. Uh, so you can go ahead, uh, share your screen, and introduce yourself. Okay, thank you very much. I'll share my screen. So my name is Hans Solomonson, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Embedal. We uh, focus on efficient deep learning in automotive and IoT, and we will touch on the things that uh, Shital mentioned here, the, both the promises and the challenges deploying uh, AI in the edge. So first, a little bit about us. Uh, we're a spin-off from Chalmers University. We're based in Gothenburg, and we are a startup. We're growing fast, and we're currently looking for two more deep learning researchers. We're visa back and uh, heavily funded by Research, European Union, and Vinova, and Tetramax, and parts of various national and international uh, networks. Um, and we, I mean, uh, deep learning in a better system is a very complicated problem. Um, so we rely on, on research partners to solving some of the problems uh, while we focus on other problems. And these are some of our uh, research partners and also customers. So what's the benefits of uh, HAI versus cloud AI? Uh, as Shital mentioned, lower latency, you don't need to go to the cloud and wait for a prediction to come back. Um, you don't have to deal with the network issues that you might have. Uh, the network might be not available. Uh, a lot of applications might be in, in uh, areas outside of the cities uh, where the network might not exist or be unreliable. Sometimes network is not required uh, or not desired because you re require some data plane plan and that uh, also communication hardware on your device, which could drive uh, complexity of your, of your product. 
Uh, and in many applications, for example, autonomous cars, there's just too much data to send via the network. Um, this could be in, 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 the, in the tens of gigabits per second, um, and that will drive a, a huge cost and also energy consumption sending this amount of data. Another very important thing is privacy, um, especially in this post GDPR world that we now live in. You cannot just send images or video streams of people. Uh, you need to have a, a, a GDPR compliant plan for that and, and uh, everything that comes with that. By doing the computations on the device, uh, you have a much, you, you, well, you don't need to focus that much on the privacy issue and the regulations around it. Uh, also, sending data to the cloud is a potential attack vector for um, people that want to um, uh, hack your device uh, or uh, in any case, any, uh, try to um, tamper with your execution. And that's obviously not good if you're in a safety critical system. Um, yes, so that was the, the good side of it. <laughs> so what's the challenge? What's the bad side of going to, to uh, embedded uh, instead of the cloud? The obvious one is the limited resources on embedded hardware platforms. Uh, and that's quite evident looking on the images here where you have Google's Edge TPU uh, compared to Google's then um, uh, TPU pods with really fast compute and storage. Um, so this puts a lot of pressure on, on the computation and how much computations you actually can do. And it can be really challenging to meet real-time requirements. And if you were doing applications in terms of autonomous systems like cars and drones and that, those things, you need a short latency to be able to react to things around you, of course. Um, another issue here is that if you want to meet real-time requirements, you, you do need to spend quite a lot of money on the hardware. Uh, this could be in the hundreds of dollars, which means that for consumer products, it's quite limited what actually innovations and new products that you can release. Uh, there's very few things that, for example, I have in my home that cost more than a, a, and more than hundreds of, of dollars. Um, also, it's more complex development and, and deployment process, uh, which drives up both the, the development costs and also the lead time. Uh, and many of these applications are also powered by batteries, so uh, minimizing the, the power usage is, is very important. Um, for example, in, in drones or smart uh, traffic um, applications, it, it's, it's vital importance. Uh, okay. So in terms of, of what we try to do is help customers develop efficient deep learning in automotive and IoT. So then we need to talk a little bit what efficient actually is. Uh, so I spend some time on, on that, um, but it's could be both in the final product, reducing the latency in the hardware cost and power consumption as mentioned before, and also in the development process, driving down the development time and the associated cost and time to market for that. Okay, so, so it's a product and a process, uh, development process. Um, but uh, let's look on, on a more, more example. And if you have two models and try to see which one are actually more efficient, see if we can agree on that. So here we have two models. One has, model one here has 87% accuracy uh, and using uh, seven giga ops, so number of operations then seven giga operations to uh, uh, make one prediction. While model two has 89% accuracy, so slightly better, but it uses almost three times the amount of operations. So which one is actually more efficient here? One is more accurate, but it uses more operations. Um, so obviously you can try to figure out one metric from this, for example, nor normalized accuracy by, by operations. That's not the very good. If you try to go that route, you will soon realize it's not very good. Um, Let's, let's try another way. Let's take a lot of the known models and plot them in a graph, operations versus accuracy. And then you will have something like this that Kanzian et al have, um, have done. Um, and we can see different uh, architectures here, uh, Inception, ResNet, VGDs. Uh, so this is image classification um, models. Um, and let's borrow a concept from economy uh, about Pareto optimality. So a situation is called Pareto optimal if no change could lead to improved satisfaction for some agent without some agent losing. 
So that's the sort of formal Wikipedia definition of it. Um, and the agents in this case is the dimension. So uh, accuracy would be one agent where we're improving the accuracy is improving for that agent and operations is the other agent and improving for that agent is reducing the number of operations because you want to do as, as few operations as possible. Um, okay, yes. So let's continue one step here. You can almost see that this forms a line which seems to be some kind of frontier or some edge uh, where you will have the good solutions. So we can see that BGG 16 and 19, for example, doesn't seem to be that efficient. And we know that these are quite old architectures and we know that they're more efficient ones, but it's quite visual in this graph. So the Pareto frontier is the set of all Pareto optimal solutions uh, or allocations. So if you have a point here on this line, you cannot improve, for example, accuracy uh, without actually um, hurt in the other dimension, in this case, number of operations. So to increase um, accuracy, you need to increase number of operations. So this is um, trade-offs, engineering trade-offs. And this is sort of the basis what we're trying to achieve here to help companies uh, sort of walking this line. So let's say that um, a company has a model, uh, the white diamond here, it does currently 10 frames per second, and that's too slow they would like to have it at 30 frames per second. So what we do is we do a lot of small tricks to try to increase the accuracy and then um, optimize the model to be able to walk this uh, Pareto frontier uh, so that the, the uh, model then can reach uh, the target requirement, which in this case was 30 frames per second. Um, Regarding deep learning optimization then, I mean, deep learning and machine learning is a very, very fast growing field. And so is deep learning optimization, which is a sort of a subfield inside uh, deep learning, uh, really started in 2015 and uh, is quite actively develop, developed right now. The problem when we started doing research in this uh, is that very few techniques actually compare with other techniques, which can be seen on the second uh, graph here to the right. Uh, and here you see how many papers that a given paper compares to. So on the x-axis, if you look on zero and one, uh, this is uh, more than half of the papers that they studied here, it was 81 uh, papers in this meta study. So more than half of the papers did compare to uh, no one or one. And many of these papers claim to be state of the art. So we quite soon realized that if we, while doing uh, actually doing ex experimentation ourselves, that there's a sort of a need for a standardized solution for this, how to uh, then systematically evaluate methods and also combining different methods, because there's a lot of different techniques and how do you actually combine them uh, in a good way and a feasible way, because the search space, when you start combining them, really grows fast. Um, and that's why we started in Battle. So it's not only about number of operations, of course. You need to have sympathy for the hardware, the underlying hardware. And there's a tremendous amount of innovations in the hardware platforms for, for HAI. Um, so on an everyday basis, we are used to CPU. And when it comes to training these networks, we use GPU. But more popular or getting more popular is also FPGAs and especially ASICs. There's a lot of innovations in specialized hardware design that are specialized for deep learning. So let's go through these platforms and see a little bit um, what the pros and cons of this might be. Uh, we'll not dive into great detail, uh, but I will have a, uh, on the next slide an example to, to sort of highlight one of the main, my view of one of the main difference between uh, CPU, GPU versus FPGA and ASIC. So CPU is a general structure and application flexible. Um, you can use it basically for any kind of, of program, right? And it's easy to add uh, custom operations, um, but it's limited parallelism. I mean, you have a num can have a number of cores, but it's compared to other platforms, it's quite limited. Uh, and has very low power efficiency as well compared to, especially then FPGA and ASIC. GPU, designed to be highly parallel, and throughput oriented turned out to be a very good to train deep learning and also 
run in, in inference, inference on them. Um, so high level of parallelism, they are easy to use due to the, um, the tools, mostly developed them by NVIDIA. Um, lower power uh, efficiency than uh, alternatives of FPGA and ASIC. Um, yes, and then FPGA. So here it's, um, it's a bit interesting. Um, here we start talking about a reconfigurable and customizable hardware architecture, which means that you can you actually design the hardware. Uh, so FPDAs is, stands for Field Program Programmable Gate Arrays. So you will actually uh, design the hardware and they are flexible to actually create that and you can then reconfigure them again. Um, so in this way, you can make something that's very specific, very tailored for a certain algorithm uh, or a specific application. Um, but you also have the benefit compared to ASIC that you can, after you deployed it, you can um, do some improvement to it. You can generate a new bit stream and you can deploy it on the FPGA and you have a new design. Uh, you don't need to physically uh, replace something. Um, so this has, FPDA has about an order of magnitude higher uh, power efficiency than CPU and GPU, um, but they are more complex to develop for and, and work. Um, it's, it's not the same way of thinking and programming and, and uh, productivity as you have with CPU and G GPUs. Okay, last, ASIC. So here you have customizable again, as with FPGAs, um, but uh, you cannot reconfigure this. Once you've designed it, put it in production, it's physical design. Uh, so once it's taped out, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, you throw it away and you go back and redo the design. This takes a lot of time to develop and it's costly to develop. But if you have a high volume product, it can be worth it. Um, and also the, uh, the, uh, the power efficiency is, is really good in an ASIC. It's a, another order of magnitude compared to the FPGA. So hardware platforms for HI are no toys, uh, but this is a toy on the, on the upper right corner here that we all recognize, um, which is finding the red, right block to the, to the right hole. Um, and one can think about if you want to structure the CPU and GPU and the limit, limitations of flexibility, um, you can structure them in this way a little bit, that the CPU and GPU are quite defined what you can do and how you use them. So you need to take your model and you need to make that fit into the particular uh, hardware platform or hardware target here. Um, while compared to FPGA and ASIC, you have much more flexibility. Um, so you actually have the saw here in the wood and you can actually cut out the, the shape that you want. And then you can change your, have the flexibility of changing the model as well. Uh, with various kind of deep learning optimization techniques, and then you can combine this and get a very efficient solution. So this is, uh, for us as a company, this is obviously super exciting. Um, so now we can sort of wrap up, wrap up how this technology stack might look then. So in the, in the front end, obviously that needs to be a model. So that uh, is developed in some kind of model like TensorFlow in PyTorch. Um, and then it's, uh, the, the customer would give uh, uh, requirements, execution time, throughput, memory uses, et cetera, and the hardware target. And we will basically optimize that and then interface various hardware backends. Um, so this, this is a problem today. And uh, with these large models and getting them efficient on uh, hardware. And it seems like it's not really a problem that will go away of itself. This plot by um, OpenAI uh, depicts the, well, the timeline on the x-axis and in log scale, uh, the training operations required for uh, training a, a model. And that's a good proxy of the complexity of the model. And we can see with time, we have created more and more co complex models. And this is likely to continue if you want to solve more and more complex problems, which the research community and industry are targeting. Um, yes. So to sum it up, um, Edge AI has many benefits of uh, cloud AI, but it also has its challenges that we talked about. 
And this is what Embedly is trying to do. Um, solve challenges relating to efficient final product and the development process. That's the things that we are targeting. And we're also happy to announce that we are hiring. Uh, so we're hiring two more deep learning researchers. So if you find this to be interesting, uh, please contact me or, or apply on our work career site. Um, and uh, thanks for listening and see you in the panelists um, later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hans, uh, for giving us the hardware perspective and also enlightening us uh, with so much knowledge. We have a few questions uh, in the chat, but I would like to uh, steal the first question. Uh, so I am just curious uh, because there are a lot of optimization engines available like Tensorati, but that is available for NVIDIA devices. Open, we know, only for Intel. Uh, but you said that Embedded works for any kind or most of the edge devices. Uh, what challenges did you face while building the tech stack for Embedded? Because it is ca catering to many edge devices. Yes, so there, there are many challenges. Uh, one is just to understanding models coming from different TensorFlow or, or deep learning frameworks, for example, TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, and they, the underlying operations there are changing all the time. That's one challenge. Um, Second challenge is that, um, well, the, on the hardware side, we, we try to not recreate uh, the wheels, so to speak, when it comes to overlap between TensorT and OpenVINA and those. Uh, the techniques that we do uh, have very little overlap with what they do. Uh, so we are focusing more on our optimizations on a graph level where we actually changing what should be computed, not how it should be computed. So TensorT, for example, takes something and execute that efficiently while we optimize what you actually compute. And that is a, a, a very challenging task to do. Um, it's not network architecture search. We start from something, uh, but then we optimize that for a particular target. And the search space is so huge because it's so many parameters in a model that you can change. And many of these are sort of set by the uh, user already because you have a ResNet or whatever you have as, as your, 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 your uh, sort of building block when you're building. And um, then you have the different sizes already set. But um, that is just by convention. That might not at all be the optimal, especially not optimal for that particular application. Um, so when you're sort of dr dragging out all the underlying parameters in the model and try to do something about that, the search space is huge. So that's a, that, that is the biggest challenge, I'd say. Yeah, okay. So as I understand, uh, also the uh, frameworks like TensorRT are open. We know they support the models uh, during the inference, but what about uh, the models while you're training? Uh, so how does Embedded uh, support training of models, for example, in a federated learning setting at the edge devices? Yeah, so that's a good question. We are focused on the inference part as well. We do not do training. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we could do that, but then it's difficult to do everything good. And we're focused on focusing on taking the problem from R&D into an actually product, in an embedded product. That's the process and the problems that arise from that, that we are trying to solve. The training part, we leave that uh, to Google and, and uh, PyTorch Facebook uh, people to, to solve. Um, they're right. quite good. <laughs> sure. Uh... Yes, we have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, so you have mentioned in your presentation uh, that in the automotive field, there is a lot of information that uh, goes back to the remote server from the fleet. Uh, so some, how, does, how is Tesla doing it right now is the question. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I think one of the, the um, interesting thing with Tesla is that they, they sort of changed uh, how the architecture of the car should be. I mean, from historically wise, we have more and more computers, but it's all dominated with a lot of suppliers uh, in, the, in the field. So it's very distributed in the car. So it's, it's, it's a lot of computers in, in a car today. And what Tesla opted for, because they could design from scratch, they could design for a supercomputer instead. And they started with an NVIDIA supercomputer. And then they, after a while, uh, don't know, we don't know the full story behind that, but uh, they decided to develop their own uh, hardware instead of using a media. 
so they did that and run, running on their own hardware, but using supercomputer. And that's what you can see, for example, with other hard, oh, sorry, uh, so other OEMs in the automotive industry, they are trying to change into that uh, way of thinking with supercomputer as well, but that's super challenging for them uh, and difficult. Right. So there's another question about how do you manage to optimize ResNet 151 for FPGA? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, that's 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 a that's a long that's a big uh, big one, I assume. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I I obviously cannot go in, in all the details of what we technically do because that's the sort of knowledge or know-how and and the product that we are selling. Um, but we use various optimizations techniques to, to, to uh, for the first to try, try to change the model and, re and remove as many operations as possible. And then depending on the size of the model and the size of the FPGA, one can use different strategies. Um, and there are different different uh, tools compared to TensorTil or something like that, that we don't need to, to write the HDL uh, code ourselves, uh, but we can interface with tools that can target the different kind of strategies you can do when you're mapping the actually algorithm to the actual hardware. Um, yes, I, I, uh, yes, I, I'm not sure that I want to go into so much detail because it <laughs> no. will be recorded. <laughs> and this, this is um, just real quickly, Hans, because uh, before we uh, move on, but uh, if uh, you're interested in, in Embedded, I, I guess, uh, and if you're interested in your solutions, I guess you can uh, reach out to you. And this is yeah. from Chris. Uh, so he thought this was really interesting. Uh, but what is your business? Uh, what are you selling to whom? Yes. So the business that we are selling is that we uh, offloading sort of the optimization uh, of deep learning models. So the R&D in the company, they develop the models. Uh, we optimize them given a certain target to meet the requirements. Yeah. And that's what we do. And we have different engagement models. Uh, the one we prefer is that we work closely. Um, and then we uh, do all of the work. We use the tools as well, but we also have the alternative to provide the tools for the deep learning team themselves to do this. But then they need to do experimentation and learning, etc. So it, it doesn't make sense unless you have a couple of people actually working on it. Uh, but but in some organizations they prefer that because they have tens uh, tens of people that actually work on, and they just want tools to make them more efficient. Um, in others, they just want to solve this problem, and then uh, we well, but then we solve it this problem. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, great. Thank you so much, Hans, uh, and you will be with us during the panel as well. Right. Yes, thanks for so, having me. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> so we'll move on to the second speaker of the day, uh, Pierre Luigi Dovesi. I have the opportunity of working with Pierre in uh, Road. Uh, data lab uh, project. So Pierre, welcome. So Pierre is a deep learning you, engineer and uh, project manager at Stockholm Virtual City uh, Universes, and he'll be talking about transforming cities with AI. So uh, hello, everybody. I'm Pierre from uh, Universes, and today I'll talk uh, about how we are transforming city with AI, and in particular today with edge AI. So let's start with the problem. Uh, I'm going to start with just three numbers. 34%. Uh, 34% is the amount of traffic that we have in our cities just due to cars looking for a parking spot. The second number is $3 billion. Well, $3 billion is the cost caused by damages uh, in the road every year in US. And finally, 33,629. Well, this is the number of death that is happening every year in US just due to poor uh, road conditions. We think that a problem of this uh, is required, this problem as a solution, and a solution is required, and universes uh, is, is, is looking for it, and we think we found it, but to achieve such a solution, we need data. We need uh, uh, timely data and accurate data all over the city infrastructure. How can we find such an amount of data? Well, and here the idea. 
Uh, now I'm showing you a map. And uh, as many of you probably recognize, this is uh, New York, uh, in particular Manhattan. And I'm going to give you another couple of numbers. Just 10 taxis uh, for just eight hours, a normal working day, can cover, on average, 30% of Manhattan. 30%. And in New York, we don't only have 10 taxis. We have 14,000 taxis. Talking about Stockholm, we have 5,500 uh, 5, uh, taxis. And in London, we have 21,000 taxis. So just imagine now for a second, if on all of these taxis, and not only taxis, but uh, on all fleet that to every day are hovering uh, over our cities, we can mount sensor to perceive the environment and gather information. Well, introducing 3D AI city. By deploying on large fleet of vehicles operating every day within the city, normal smartphone empowered by universes AI, we can process on the edge and then aggregate and process and then aggregate in the cloud large amount of information. And then we can display all this information uh, in a user-friendly dashboard that then will be made available to city officials and other stakeholders. Let's see the system in action. This is not just a concept. It exists. It's, it's already here. So we see the, the smartphone that is, can just be mounted on a windscreen. And uh, once you activate the app, all the, the AI just uh, start to process data, uh, vision data, and uh, in the edge. And then you can see the dashboard that is getting uh, updated. Then, what we can see here is that, uh, of course, our system works, as I said, all the AI on the edge. So there is no personal data processed in our, in our AI. But anyway, sometimes we need to collect data. And when we do that, all our data, the data that we gather are anonymized prior to storage to preserve the personal, uh, to preserve the uh, anonymity and do not compromise any personal data. Then we can see some uh, detection here of roadworks, of traffic signs, and, uh, and, and road cracks. And much more is coming soon. So a question that, uh, that you might wonder is, OK, what can be detected with this system? And the answer is actually everything that you see while you're driving your car can and will become a feature. M many of these features, such as road damage, infrastructure damage, and roadwork are already here. Others will come very soon, such as vehicle traffic and pedestrians, and many others are currently under development. So let's see this system, uh, a real deployment. So this happened in uh, Italy, actually during the lockdown period this year. So this was a remote deployment. We just uh, let the user uh, download in the app. And then, as you can see, the uh, the app it just start working. You can see that all the road cracks are correctly detected. Uh, and you can even see the result directly on the phone since it's on the edge. Uh, the map, the dashboard is automatically updated. And in this case, we decided to update it using a heat map that uh, describe the level of damage on the road according to the, level, the number and the severity of the road cracks. And this is a very useful representation for a city official that can therefore understand where are the main problems in the city. Another example here is a different use case. Uh, here, we are not looking for road, work, uh, road, road cracks, but we're looking for traffic signs. And for this specific feature, uh, we need to go one step forward. It's not enough to have a a heat map, but here we want to find an exact location of the speed sign. So the city can track if, the, if a, seat, uh, a traffic sign has been damaged or is missing or there's any problem with it. So here we apply a technology called triangulation. And uh, since our system, as I said, is on the edge and it's really fast, we can detect, we can detect multiple instances of the same, uh, of the same speed sign. By doing so, we can triangulate them by unprojecting the speed sign over array, starting from the car 
to the speed sign, and then we can find the intersection between these projections. And by doing so, we can reach an accuracy that is much higher than a GPS, and we can actually go well beyond uh, one meter accuracy. So let, let's talk a, a bit about us, uh, universes. So uh, universes is a Stockholm-based startup founded in 2015. Uh, we are experts in telecomputer vision and machine learning. We are 33 people and growing. And all of us has a PhD in computer vision and robotics. And these are some of our amazing partners that we are collaborating now and, and will collaborate also in the future. But today it's a tech day uh, and I want to talk about our research. In particular, universities is publishing several papers, but today I'm gonna focus on the research that we're doing with AI on the edge. So the first uh, paper that I'm presenting you is called Enhancing Self-Supervised Monocular Depth Estimation with Traditional Visual Odometry. It has been published in 3DV 2019. So what is monocular depth estimation? Well, uh, the concept is pretty easy. Uh, you have monocular camera, so just the smartphone camera, and you want to find the depth of the scenario. Uh, finding depth means that you want to find for every single pixel of the image, how much distance is that the, between the pixel and the camera itself. And so you can reconstruct our geometric representation of the scenario. Um, Usually, this system works in the following way. Now, I don't want to go too much in details, but uh, the way that we can solve the problem is to train the system with a self-supervised approach. So from the left image, we try to reconstruct the, the right one. And from the right one, we want to reconstruct uh, the left one. By applying this kind of reconstruction, we implicitly need to learn depth as a sub-information. And we use this implicit understanding to uh, obtain a self-supervised depth. Of course, we need to use a stereo input pair for the training. Well, but there's another way that we can find that. And in particular, this is, uh, so if, you, if some of you work with computer vision some years ago, you will remember, uh, this is the visual uh, odometry. So visual odometry algorithm are using uh, uh, key points, finding the image, such as corners uh, and uh, other relevant features, and track this point over time. Tracking this point over time allows to uh, have a quite good depth understanding of this point. But you can see these points are very sparse. And the uh, convolutional neural network doesn't uh, like a sparse point, unfortunately. So we need to find a way to densify this point and to make a this input suitable for a convolutional neural network. What we did at universes was to take this point that uh, you can see are sparse and we use a, spar a sparsity invariant autoencoder. So by applying this, this point from sparse, they become pretty dense. And then these can be used in the neural network. So here we can see that we have two modules so first we densify this point and then we concatenate this depth information to the RGB input. Once we have this four channel input, then it's pretty easy to obtain a depth. And we can see that this system works uh, surprisingly well. Uh, we reach, uh, so we developed two systems, one for big GPU. Uh, and I think that we use a 28 TTI and uh, we reached uh, the highest accuracy between uh, monocular depth estimation. And then we develop another, another network that instead is uh, supposed to be to run in real time. And this network instead uh, is able to go really, really fast while achieving really good accuracy as well. And uh, we tested it on uh, NVIDIA Jetson TX2 that is an embedded device, uh, really used for research and uh, these kind of things. So let's see how this, uh, this system works because the numbers can tell up to a certain point, but then we want to see uh, the result. Here you can see this can be done with a smartphone actually. So you just smart mount the smartphone in your car and you can get the depth information while reconstructing uh, a 3D map, an HD map. So the second paper that I want to present you today, it's much newer, it's ICRA 2020. Um, 
and uh, it focuses on a different problem. So this time we have a sear camera and uh, we don't want to find just the depth of our scenario, but we also want to find the uh, semantics nature of, of what we see. So we have a robot and as I said, we want to find, uh, we want to understand the environment uh, as a, in its contextual nature and to uh, do this task, we want to do semantic segmentation. While the second task that we want to do together because actually mobile robots need both of them at the same time is, as I said, that information. So, but in mobile robotics, there are other challenges. This is not enough just to find them together at the same time. Uh, the system, as we know, has to work in high speed and with good accuracy because the system needs to work in, in the real world. Uh, so we need a good, so high FPS, but also good enough accuracy. The computational power needs to be low because we are thinking about mobile robotics here. So uh, we cannot, we don't have always uh, big GPUs uh, at our disposal. And uh, we want to find a good trade-off and a dynamic trade-off between speed and accuracy. What do I mean with this? So in some circumstances, the robot might move very fast. And if the robot moves very fast, uh, we need really high uh, output rate, but we, and we can sacrifice the accuracy for that. We don't care so much about the accuracy. We, we really want high FPS. In other kinds of scenarios instead, it's much more important uh, to have high accuracy and we can sacrifice a bit the output rate. And what we want to do is to do this trade-off dynamically. We don't want to have different perception module according to the robot need. So we developed a system that is able to take all, all these problems together. So by using a shared encoder, we extract features for developing both depth information and semantic segmentation by using two different decoders. And we do this in three different resolutions. So we have the speed accuracy trade-off. Finally, we also merge these two embeddings once again uh, to further improve the depth information. And we have been the first one to the, uh, able to develop a system that can simultaneously take all semantic segmentation and depth prediction in real time on an embedded device. So let's see some result now. Uh, this is a short video that will show you what you can do with this system. So here you have a normal, like uh, a road. This could be like a car, for example. And uh, you can see that you can get the depth information. So as I said, the darker pixel, the farther away it is. So you can get a geometric description of what you can see. And uh, here we see that uh, we are around uh, four FPS and while 96 FPS on a larger GPU. Here with the segmentation, here it's really, really fast. So we are going at 62 FPS on a, an embedded device. And uh, here we finally see uh, uh, the, the refined depth. Here you see uh, the improvement and uh, I'm going forward now. Okay. But uh, so this has been the two papers that I present you today. Uh, there's more. I want to also show you a bit what uh, the future challenges and uh, the vision of uh, universes and its technology. So I want to start uh, with a story for you, Atul, uh, that is uh, the data hidden challenges. So uh, this is an airplane. And in particular, it is a World War II airplane. In particular, uh, we are talking about the US Navy and it was facing, they were facing a really critical problem. So many bombers that were, get, uh, were really getting shot down when they were run, running over Germany. Uh, so they need a quick solution. What do you do? You just call that a scientist. So the approach was straightforward. After each mission, the bullet holes and the damage from each bomber was reviewed and recorded. And you can see the result here. So the solution, once you create this map was pretty clear, just increase the armor on the areas where there are some more holes. So the wings and the body. That's pretty easy, right? So, well, 
just a few hours before the submission, the mathematician, uh, Abraham Wald, uh, checked once again the data and he found out that the conclusion was completely wrong. So can you see why already? Uh, Wald noticed how the, the researcher only uh, looked at bombers who were turned to the base. So what was missing from the data? Well, every single plane that has been shot down in Germany. So does the same principle that I'm telling you right now apply to vehicle as a sensor system such as 3 city? Well, the answer is yes, and let's see why. So a common opinion between deep learning practitioners uh, and computer vision scientists is that, uh, well, with a deep learning and computer vision module, without any blind spot, vehicle as a sensor system can detect and map everything. But then, you can ask, okay, what about the blind spot of your fleet? And in particular, how many cars do you need to perform a certain task? How frequently can I update my information on this road? And how much time does it take to cover that area? And for and foremost, what is the system fair? Are you sure you are covering all the city in the same way without excluding any district or penalizing it? Well, what we need to understand here is that the detection capability of the single feature, so the sensor domain, the computer vision, is only a part of the problem. And it's completely different from the detection capability of the feature over the city, so on the city domain. Here, I'm showing you some graph uh, that represent uh, the coverage that you have in a city and how many cars or trips uh, you need to perform to obtain that kind of coverage. And you see that just with a normal natural exploration path provided by taxis, you really need high number of vehicles to reach high coverage over one day. We think that this is not enough and this, is not, is, this exploration is not even fair. Therefore, we need to enhance, enhance this exploration. So the solution is the following. We need to see, understand, predict, and ultimately control the fleet. So here I'm showing an historical drawing uh, of an AI. And you, we see that uh, every AI and actually control system is composed by two sections. One, to observe the system. And the second one, to control and orchestrate the system. So we are developing now the first uh, fleet observer. So a set of tools able to actually understand and predict what's going on with the fleet. And the second one is a fleet orchestrator, another set of tools that instead will help to move and influence the fleet toward the routes that need to be uh, mapped. So why we're doing all of this? Well, uh, for us, what is crucial is not just to have smarter city, but we want to have sustainable city. So we are thinking about social and environmental sustainability here. Uh, we are uh, really clear UN goals in mind. And uh, as I said, not just smarter city, but livable cities. So thank you all. And uh, this was my presentation. Thank you so much, Pierre. Uh, very interesting. And, and you will be with us in the panel later, so we will get back to you with a couple of questions uh, from the chat. Yes. And it's, it's very fascinating to know that you have been publishing in top conferences of vision and uh, robotics. Uh, we, we'll see you soon and uh, talk about some of the challenges uh, in the panel. So now we have the third speaker for the day. Uh, Welcome, Sophie Dressing. Sophie is a product owner uh, for Fleet Insight at Zensact, and she'll be talking about challenges of and future of fleet management. Hi, Sophie. Uh, Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Super interesting uh, in presentations. Um, let's see if I can keep up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So my name is Sophie Tressing. Um, I'm working with enablers, enabling continuous enhancements of products. 
and that by um, setting up uh, an arena for edge computing and data collection from our fleet of vehicles at customers. Uh, and I'm working as a product owner for a product called Fleet Insight, which is exactly that tool that's going to enable this. And I have close collaboration with Volvo Cars developing this. So, so it's a really important technology for, for the automotive uh, business. So if we're looking at uh, uh, Sense Act, uh, so Sense Act, we're developing uh, safe uh, self-driving features and this by creating an unsupervised autonomous vehicle solution platform that's gonna be uh, um, applicable for um, the autonomous market. Um, and we are driving this together with our lead customer, Volvo Cars. And what we are basically doing is that we are sensing in the surrounding of the car by uh, interpreting the sensing information as an input. And that could be radar, camera, maps, and so on. And we are taking in this data, we are doing decision making, and then we are activating the car in a safe way. Uh, so this is basically what we are doing at SenseAct as like a core development. And what is really important when we are developing this is that we have a way of continuously evolve this platform and this software. And this to provide a safer car experience every day, but also improve or, or enhance the, the experience of that car. Uh, and we want to be able to, to yeah, create living products. And for this, we need to have easy access to a customer fleet. We need to have uh, access to a flexible compute engine in the car so we can actually deploy online analytics down to edge. And we need to set up a backend so we can actually manage the insights and the data that we extract from the fleet and use that when we are developing new features and improving the, the system. And as the uh, final step in this loop is actually to also do software updates uh, to the car to upgrade the system. So this is a loop that is very important and Fleet Insight is a product that is contributing a lot in, in this way of working. But if we should talk a little bit about the backend piece, um, so logically we can divide the backend into two different pieces. One that we call the cloud backend and, and that piece is basically responsible for the connectivity to the cars. We have some uh, initial centralized analytics done in cloud, and we also can control what assignments should be dispatched to what part of the fleet. So that is just some features that's gonna be a part of the cloud backend. But then we also have the, what we call the landing backend. And here we're gonna perform all the heavy workloads, such as the simulation, simulation, deep learning training, you know, all these workloads that require a lot of storage and compute. Uh, and those workloads, they are tools that we are using for doing data-driven development of, of, of software. And then we should have in mind that we will have several clouds, we will have several backend. So having the functionality of routing the data set from the fleet to the right backend, that's going to be a major one. Uh, so that is what we're looking into at the moment. And if you should just mention a little bit about the over the air capability. It's talked about we need to be able to upgrade the system in the car in order to, to provide a better vehicle experience. But we also need to make sure that we can continuously deploy assignments to the fleet. And the main difference between a, a assignment over the update and a software over the update is that the assignment over the update is going to be a passive online analytics uh, script that we are running in the car in order to evaluate the health of the fleet. Software is actually something that's going to be able to activate the vehicle. So the differences and, uh, between these two is that the process for enabling this is, is a little bit different. Okay. But before we're going into uh, edge computing and our ambitions around that, I just want to get us familiar with a concept that we call the uh, resimulation. And the reason for that is that this is a tool that we are using uh, on the data that we are getting from the fleet. So imagining that you can use the same set of input data into a simulation environment where you can resimulate the behavior of different version of the same feature. 
And if you have this capability, then you can compare uh, different releases over time. So you can track the evolution of your software. Uh, and that is exactly what we are doing. So if we look at our software, it's divided into different functions block. And one function block could be, for example, a vision, computer vision, to basically interpret what the camera sees. Another function block could be sensor fusion, and another could be decision and control. But when we are doing re-simulation, we are logging data on the earliest phase of the software stack. So we can push that data into the next version of software and trigger a new output. And if you have early state data, then you can regenerate information from all these different building blocks. So for example, if we have a log file containing uh, raw camera data, we are pushing that to the resim, then we can uh, generate the object and the classifications done by the computer vision algorithm. And that acts as an input to the next function block. And um, that is argumentation for why a log file uh, logged on a very early phase, like low-level low, low sensor data, but they, what, why they, that log file is so important for us. And often when you're doing a simulation, you want to look into a, 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 a scenario that could be five seconds, 10 seconds. And then you can imagine having 10 seconds log file with raw sensor data. That is quite a huge log file. And if you're considering offloading that file from the vehicle, that's going to be very demanding on the system. So here we need to look into uh, opportunities to optimize, uh, which I will talk about a little bit uh, later on. But the, and one optimization could be, for example, that if we're finding an improvement in the sense of fusion block in the middle, maybe we just need to log the output from the vision algorithm at that point. All right, moving on. Uh, so we can consider a simulation as um, a digital twin of the real vehicle. Um, so basically, we are fetching log files from the real world, from the fleet. We are ingesting that data through the cloud to the backend piece. And apart from the simulation, we are also doing simulation, which is one important tool as well. And when doing sim simulation, we are looking into real data from traffic, and then we can do a variation of that scenario to increase the scenario space. So we can argue for a safe function. Um, and the third workload is deep learning training that is also very computer heavy. And here we need to continuously have data from the fleet in order to train our vision algorithm to understand the dynamic world that we are living in, for that algorithm to evolve with um, the dynamic environment around the car going forward. All right. So if we zoom out a little bit and we take a look at Fleet Insight as a data collection tool, we have some building blocks in the car, for example, logging, which is about getting data from our features and applications and get that presented to a flexible compute engine. And this flexible compute engine could host uh, assignments of different kinds. And then we have the data offloading piece, which is basically the mechanism of packaging the data and getting the data off the car to our backend in cloud and also backend in the landing zone. So we can use that when doing data-driven development. But if we should focus a little bit about the onboard capabilities of Fleet Insight, uh, if we're describing the mechanisms that we have, as I told you before, we are fetching information from sensors. We're feeding that information into different features and applications. If we want to be able to, to measure the performance of our features, uh, if we want to identify uh, improvement areas, um, uh, the pattern of how these features are used and so on, then we need to be able to present rele uh, relevant information to this query engine that we have in the car. And this query engine is very sandboxed, so you should be able to run different kinds of assignments. And that could be, as mentioned, KPI measurements, could be trigger conditions, uh, edge AI, statistics. You know, we have a lot of opportunities here. And when we are identifying that we have something interesting to look into further in the backend, then we trigger a mechanism to basically fetch that data, package it, 
compress it, and then we can offload it uh, to, to the backend in two different ways, batch and streaming. That is, that is the plan. <laughs> um, so we are aiming for uh, doing insights as early as possible. So already in the car, we should make insights, insights about our product. And if we can enable that one, we can optimize the resources related to bandwidth, network, but also backend resources. But though it puts more requirements on the resources on board. So here we have a, need to have a discussion about how do we balance those different components in order to create an optimized system when it comes to CPU, RAM and disk. Um, and that is a little bit what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, because if you look at these different components, uh, for example, we have RAM. If we want to have the opportunity to analyze a bigger window of data, uh, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, we require more shared memory in order to do so. Uh, if we go if we're looking at the disk part, if we want to optimize the way we are offloading identified data sets to the backend, we need to have some way of storing that data in the car before uh, we have a proper offloading method available. And that would require more disk space, right? If we're looking at the CPU part, so if we want to optimize disk uh, resources on board, then we can look into compression. So we can compress the data before restoring it to disk, but compression requires CPU load. And we can also look into, maybe we don't want to be that trigger happy when it comes to offloading the data from the board. And in that case, we also need to do more advanced assignments. And that also requires more uh, compute. And finally, the network piece. So how do we want to offload the data from the board? Uh, do, we, do we want to do it most cost efficient or more, most uh, speedy way? I mean, that is a trade-off. Um, that we need to look into. So these are the kind of balancing discussions that you need to have when you are developing a, a feature like Fleet Insight, uh, to, to know how you're optimizing the system based on the use cases and the assignments that you are foreseeing that you, you're gonna run in the car. Um, okay, so brainstorming a little bit about future capabilities when it comes to edge computing in this industry. Um, just imagining that we can store data on board the vehicle and we can actually download the heavy workloads to the car because the car today is basically a supercomputer on wheels. And to be able to, to be actually process data on board the vehicle while, while it's on stand still or in charge, I think that would be really cool. Uh, if you look at federated learning, I mean, at some point in time, maybe we have very hard restrictions on what data we are, are allowed to upload from the vehicle. And at that point, it would be really good to have the opportunity to actually deploy algorithms to the vehicles, train on the edge, and then make conclusions in the more global algorithm in the end, just considering the weights of, of the trained algorithm at edge. So that is something that we are looking into as, as a, uh, assurance for the future and what we are really involved in when it comes to AI Sweden and, and the projects that we are running. And here the Edge Lab is a real key for us to be able to experiment and then see if, how this concept can be applicable for our case. And then we have the final one and I'm just con like as I mentioned we have supercomputer on wheels just imagining creating large compute farms by clustering vehicles and be able to use that to distribute the data and workloads to do uh, computing in the future. I mean, this is not, nothing we have in the roadmap at this point, but for me, this is very interesting. And I mean, this area is, is full of opportunities. All right, that, I think that was all for me. Thank you so much, Sophie. Very interesting. And, and regarding fleet management, we, both from a uh, university standpoint and, and from a uh, Sensac standpoint, it's, uh, it will be an interesting topic to follow and an interesting area. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I have a few questions uh, from my side as well. Uh, so could you share some light on the use cases uh, that from Sensac that you think are uh, good for applying federated learning? Uh, because as I understand, in the fleet, we do not have annotated data uh, and probably supervised learning might be a tough thing to do in, from the fleet. So could you share some light on the use cases? 
Exactly. I mean, c- c- imagining uh, being able to evaluate different driver behaviors. I mean, we have information in the car about the lanes, the distance to the lane, uh, the margin from the ego, ego vehicle to the vehicle in front. I mean, if we can see that information, then we can also very easily um, train algorithms in different uh, regions um, about how actually the driver is activating the car. And we can use that in order to tune the system as the next step. Uh, so I see that we have a lot of areas where we can actually apply federated learning that doesn't necessarily uh, is the vision use case, but we can actually use uh, information on the signal level, like lanes, uh, distances, uh, steering wheel angle, and, and ego, ve- ego vehicle data. Yeah, okay, that, that sounds really interesting. So, yes, and now uh, we'll move to the panel discussion. So uh, I request all the speakers uh, to join the panel discussion by uh, switching on your cameras and, and muting yourself. Yes. Right, so great, again, thanks all the speakers and great presentations. I've been sitting here doing some sketches and like trying to figure out like uh, what we all have in common except working on the edge. Um, So just a summary. So Hans, you talked a bit about your company in Bedel and you're doing deep learning optimization on different edge platforms, you can say. Pierre, you talked about computer vision where you're constrained to the mobile phone and you also half of your talk was about like cutting cutting research that you're doing on, on computer vision. And as Sophie, you talked about your uh, product, Fleet Insight, that's uh, one of the products of SenseAct in Volvo cars and all the challenges involved in both capturing data, storing data, working with the data, data in different, different backends. So I think what we all have in common is that we, you're in the forefront of working with, with Edge. So if you go back to yourself a year ago, so my question, like for Hans, you can start, like, uh, what are the learnings so far of how you're working with Edge and how you prioritize the challenges? Like, how do you structure a team uh, and then you discover new challenges? How do you prioritize them and how do you go about? It's very difficult to plan uh, the work. I mean, we have two very differ- different uh, processes. One is the sort of research uh, uh, things that we do. And those we cannot plan more than the next experiment. Uh, so we try uh, to do idea development, um, but that works much better when it comes to software that delivers uh, the, the algorithms. Um, and there we can work so sort of idea with that. With research, we are still trying to figure out a good way of, of, of combining both of those uh, because some tasks um, you might have more research related, some are more on, on the software development side. Um, so I, I, in general, I think that, the, but that's not, I guess, for only for edge TPU, but or for for edge, uh, but for every every sort of research-oriented company that also develops a product. Um, but just, uh, I mean, the hardware explosion that we have right now, and that we see there's so many companies and so many uh, ways of doing things, um, trying to find in that landscape and understand that land- landscape and find your position in that landscape is uh, is a bit of a challenge and that that is something that we are working on and we're learning a lot by talking with with customers um, um, and we're talking quite a lot for customers these days so i think i'm very positive for for the next for the next year uh, yeah right thank you and what do you think uh, pierre do you see the same challenges of both like working with uh software in production and, and combining it with your research? Absolutely. I mean, especially for us that we are in a startup, the research and development are very entangled in every possible aspect. So we always proceed with the agile development, of course. So we just want to find one single feature and we develop an MVP for that. And then we validate it with our customers, partners, and then we iterate on top of that. But, of course, we are in uncharted territory. So this is with the feeling that we have every single day. So no one have ever tried what we are trying to do. And we don't have any reference for this. 
So many times it's usually hard to find a balance between exploration and exploitation in this way. So how much you need to go through stuff that already exists out there and uh, what reference can you find? And other times instead you really need your time to explore. And this means going back to the papers, their search and find new things that you can make the product great. Right. And do you have the same challenge of, uh, as Hans said, there's uh, explosion in available hardware. So you're more constraints to the mobile phone, but also we see new yes. phones coming up all the time. Well, yes. I mean, we started with the mobile phone since we think it's the more uh, user-friendly tools that everybody has already. So it doesn't require, we don't bound ourselves to specific hardware, even though we have nothing against it, uh, as a, uh, to be honest. But even in the smartphone, I can say that there is a pretty a, a large explosion. I mean, not a few, I mean, I think just a, a few months ago, there has been the first TPUs in a commercial smartphone. That is something that was unprecedented. And uh, I can only imagine that this explosion will keep going. And the smartphone power is, I mean, it's really exploding now every single year. Right. And what are your thoughts regarding this question, Sophie? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Could you just repeat the question a little quickly? Right. So you're learning so far in working with uh, Edge and, and Fleet Insight of, of yeah. how you prioritize and, and structure your team. And, and... Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, if, <laughs> from my perspective, it's, it's very... I mean, Fit Insights is a very broad solution. We do imp uh, implementation in the car. We're doing connectivity and the back end. So from our point of view, we need to have a holistic view of this development because we need to have the end-to-end -end functionality. Otherwise, this will not work. And what we are focusing on right now is the onboard part. How do we actually optimizing the system on board so we can deploy assignments to the car? And because we consider that once we're going into production, that environment will not be as accessible as a backend, like a cloud or a data center. So that is the current priorities at the moment that we are focusing more on, on, on board and make that safe. Right. And, and regarding your constraints, so what is your customer or customer saying there? So are you able to work with the same platform as you're working sort of with your uh, your your research platform as in production, or do you see like you will need to take a step back? I see. I mean, we are having uh, different environments within uh, Sensex and Volvo Cars when we are developing uh, the platform. We have something that we call a rapid car, and that is basically just to be able to test out functionality very quickly. In that car, we have a lot of compute, a lot of memory, no constraints. <laughs> And if we look at the target platform, I mean, we have limitation and boundaries that we need to adapt to. So if we would just develop Fleet Insight using the rapid car, we will not have a function that would be applicable for, for the production intent uh, hardware. So it's a balance between being able to like work on a concept all the way to production and also balance that with actually doing implementation work in the target platform. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a balance. Right, and it seems like you have found it at least. Yeah. So, so um, regarding the maturity of the market, you can also answer this if you uh, firstly like. Mm. So, is is your customer? They understand completely that we're moving away from cloud to edge. Um, I mean, I, I've seen that we're going to use both cloud and edge. Uh, but yeah, we are moving more to edge uh, because we want to do insights as quickly as possible. Um, but we also foresee that cloud going to be the main uh, contributor when it comes to central analytics or and, and holistic view of the fleet to be able to see pattern uh, in the fleet for different regions, for example. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination, but absolutely more edge than before. Right. What are your thoughts there, Hans? Like, yeah, you, you have, have more variety of customers. So how's the majority there and, and their understanding of what we're talking about here? Differs a lot. Uh, I mean, some companies have hundreds of people working with deep learning and obviously they are 
very well aware of the when to use edge and when not to use edge, uh, or at least, yeah. But in, in, in other cases, they might start their AI journey and then it, it might not be so easy to choose what to do uh, and what not to do. What, what should it do in developing house and what should they outsource? So when you're talking with customers, it's such different discussions depending on the customer that we are talking with. Um, and that, that's very interesting, but it's also very challenging for a startup because you, it might be difficult to, to satisfy both those customer segments. Yeah. Right. It's all about that product market fit that you ideally find someday. So Pierre, so you, you're relying on, as I understand, crowdsourcing and, and having the, the everyday person collecting data for you using their phone. If yeah, I more, correctly. Uh, it doesn't we are targeting especially fleets. So not really every, every it's like, like Uber and uh, could be Uber, could be especially taxis, uh, could be bus companies, delivery freight. Uh, we prefer to rely on fleet and every day than just uh, normal people using their phone, despite that option is still on the table. But we, now we believe in the in the fleet power somehow. So these fleets that are every day on the road, uh, therefore they can allow like really timely data gathering. Right, and what's the incentive for the fleets to, to use your product? That's a very good point. So we actually want to provide services to the fleet itself. So by, the, by using our system, for example, when I'm talking about the fleet observer and fleet orchestrator, and if a taxi company is using this system and collecting data that we then we can provide to municipality for to the municipality for example then the fleet itself can benefit from uh, insights regarding the fleet uh, disposition over the city or even orchestration to move and influence the taxis to better distribute that vehicles over the over the areas and to move toward the customers for example this allows them for a, like a uh, lower cost, less idle time, and uh, higher customer reach. Right. So, but, so if I understand your research correctly, you could actually recognize depth from a uh, one lens of your phone. Yes. So, so is this the depth of lidar? Well, of course, the, the accuracy is uh, is not comparable with a lidar. And uh, also the cost of the sensor is not comparable with the LiDAR since uh, the LiDAR are really, really expensive and they break down really easily. And of course, you, you can't imagine right now uh, to, to deploy large amount of LiDARs over, over fleets of vehicles. Uh, they, the, the LiDAR that we have today uh, are, I don't think are suitable for mass production and mass deployment with the exception of solid state lidars that are still in a very low technology readiness level. Um, of course, that's, that's an option. We now, uh, for us, the depth understanding is just one of the many features that we develop. If tomorrow there are gonna be new sensors or new lidars that we can rely on, we'll be really happy. And that's really synergistic with what we're trying to do. Right, thank you. Chital, do you have any Yes, I, yes, I have a comment on the uh, touching upon the same uh, concept because currently the iPhone 12s are coming with the LiDAR sensor. Uh, so do you have plans of switching to <laughs> using iPhone 12 now uh, and uh, changing your algorithms probably? <laughs> well, not really. Uh, also because the, the, the smartphone will be placed inside the windscreen. So I'm not sure about what is the <laughs> performance of the LiDAR with a mirror in front of it. But uh, uh, of course, uh, I, I mean, as I said, we, we are actually not closing up any option. Right now we are expert in computer vision. And of course we also use LiDAR really often. But um, right now in the city domain, in the 3 dicd city domain, we, we rely on cameras. Right. So I think we're wrapping this up and I thought about just ending with a final question. But, but Sophia, just a comment. I loved your idea of, of having the fleet as sort of a clustered supercomputer. <laughs> it was a new idea for me. So I think we, it seems like we need to rely on the cars even more, both for battery storage and now also uh, protein folding at home, apparently. Yeah, yeah. 
that's just a great idea. But yeah. so, so last question for all of you, uh, we're taking the, the round table, like, but where, where are we in six to 12 months? And what do you see or what do you hope to see? If we start with Yusufi. Um, I hope that we're going to have the first prototype running in uh, our development vehicles and that our developers, both at Sensect and Volvo Cars, are using this concept when developing uh, the next generation of software going in production for uh, SPA2. That's, that's really what I'm hoping for. Right. And that we are continuously enhancing this product over time from, from right. that point in time. Mm. I'll follow up on you and that in, in a year from now. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> what about you, Hans? I hope, I hope, really hope. And I think that we'll see uh, sort of gradual uh, deployments of, of uh, HAI. Um, and that we now are starting to see the actual benefits of it, that we are past sort of the hype and in the next year and two and three, we actually have more um, much mature companies uh, producing um, useful and valuable products using HAI. Um, I think that it will happen gradually. Uh, and uh, I just hope that in general, people don't expect too much today, but have some patience that it might take a year or two. Uh, but the, the applications that, that we see from various uh, companies that we're talking with, it could be really, really cool. And we're really excited uh, about that and being part of that journey, helping uh, companies taking their um, HAI products to the market. Thank you. And lastly, you care. So we just started a new project with the Stockholm Stud, KTH and Taxi Stockholm. So, and it's called the Stockholm Digital Parking. So for the new, like for the next six to 12 months, uh, you're gonna have really relevant news regarding the uh, parking detection and occupancy state here in Stockholm. So hopefully in 12 months, you'll be able to see yourself and test it out. So if you're looking for a parking spot, you might, might be able to use the 3D ICT functionality. That's a great future. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, panel. Uh, and it's, it's a great having you with us. Uh, AI Sweden wouldn't be anything without its partners. So it's a very, very... Um, value creative or value creation that you are a part of the, the program and, and share everything you do uh, and uh, we hope to hear more of you within the over the coming six to twelve months then uh, to get you updated on that uh, but now i want to turn to shital and eric uh, so we're in the transformation towards hai um, what are your key takeaways from today uh, from a technology point of view, uh, I see that there are some uncharted territories in federated le uh, learning, suppose, uh, that uh, we have not still explored. So, but I see that uh, our partners and uh, our get up in solving that challenges by collaborating with us and engaging with us. So uh, this is an open call to all of us. If you want to engage with us, uh, please uh, uh, contact us. We'll uh, have our uh, email IDs in the chat below. And then you can also look up uh, uh, on a website about the Federated Learning Project. Yeah. Uh, and Eric, being uh, the project manager for the Federated Learning Project, what do you want partners to do? Uh, I want partners to know about the technology, like start thinking about use cases, read up on like just Google the technology and then there's a great comic on, on Google, put together by Google. And then hopefully we have the foundation for you in end of March that you can really act as a catalyst for you to start working with this new technology in end of March. So keep an eye out. Yeah. And uh, we will have some news next week uh, about what we discussed or presented earlier. Uh, so we really want to build this up because this is a great, or it will be a great opportunity for, for all partners uh, to get moving fast. Uh, so I really hope that you will uh, stay with us uh, during next week as well, uh, because it's going to be interesting. Um, Shital, you as a data scientist uh, working uh, with a lot of our partners, uh, recently the uh, AI Hackathon uh, together with uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, what would you like to see uh, partners do? 
Uh, I would like partners to reach us uh, by engaging more in hackathons. You have heard from uh, Alan yesterday about how much cost efficient it is to uh, actually have these hackathons as part of the organization. So uh, we are here to help you. So please reach out to us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric and Chital, thank you so much for joining me here uh, today. Eric from from uh, down in the south in Skåne and Chital directly here from the studio. Uh, tomorrow we will be back uh, live from here starting at eight and then we will go into the business side uh, of AI. It's time for the business day. And as we heard yesterday, the business side of AI is hugely important. We need management, we need executives, we need business people to understand the opportunities and the benefits with the field of AI. Uh, so this is really a call for action from us uh, to, if you're a, a more tech savvy person uh, and working with tech, point and, and really drag your business people into the field of AI now. They need to start moving or we need to start moving because it's really the intersection between business, the domain experts uh, and the data experts and then the uh, AI experts in where we get things going and th that's where we create value. So tomorrow we will be live from eight in the morning again and I hope to see you then.